Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Deed Harrison, President of Chiropractic Biophysics Technique and President of Chiropractic Biophysics Nonprofit, our Spine Research Foundation. If you've been watching these video reviews, you know what they're all about. This is video review number 47. I'm going through each one of our CVP Nonprofit uh, peer review pu peer reviewed publications in a video review format just because I know people do not read the videos and I like to have a documentation of these videos and I like to send them out to chiropractors and prospective patients, right? These vi videos are highly educational and informative in regards to the spine and in regards to chiropractic biophysics technique. This week I've chosen one of our more recent publications from 2015 that details what is the evidence for chiropractic corrective care for pediatric cervical abnormalities of the cervical lordosis. In other words, how effective are chiropractic techniques at treating or correcting the loss of the cervical curve in children? Okay, now you might say, well, that's the same as doing it in adults. We actually already know what the evidence is for adults. We know that chiropractic biophysics technique, the CBP extension traction methods, are hands down the number one gold standard in the peer-reviewed literature for conservative rehabilitation of the adult abnormal cervical curvature. We know extension traction works. We know it. We've done multiple randomized trials, non-randomized trials, etc. But what about in children? What is the evidence? Is there any? Is there something we can do better in the future? That's what this particular project details. So the title of the project, Restoration of Pediatric Cervical Lordosis, that means the side curve in the neck, a review of the efficacy of chiropractic techniques and their methods. This comes from the Journal of Pediatric, Maternal and Family Health, September 21st, 2015. The lead author is my good friend and CBP instructor and CBP researcher out of uh, Canada, Dr. Paul Oakley and then myself. So just a, a background, look, there's still controversy over this even though in 1977 the controversy was actually solved. You still hear when we're in our undergrad and grad courses about pediatric spines that the cervical curve uh, forms post birth. So it forms after the kid comes out and after the child or during when the child starts to crawl and sit etc. So it's called a secondary curve. Well I'm here to tell you that's wrong. Absolutely wrong. 1977 was a project that came out in the Journal of Anatomy that showed that the cervical curve forms in utero. In utero. If you look at this project it'll blow you away. 195 fetuses obtained from hysterotomies. Okay, now unfortunately, yeah, they were pulled out early due to complications with the mother and with the baby. So these are hysterotomies, but then they fixed the, the baby, or excuse me, the fetus in formalin, and then they looked at what the state of the sagittal plane curves were. Here's what they identified. When we're about eight to 23 weeks conceptual age, eight to 23 weeks conceptual age, so that's in the, in the womb, 83% have a well-defined cervical curve. It's well-defined. The authors of the, the study in 1977 describe it as a piece of a circle of interest. You can look that project up, 1977. Journal of Anatomy, here it is. Volume 123, page 777 through 782. 11% of the fetuses were straight, and then 6%, only 6%, were in what's classically called the fetal flex neck position. That's what we commonly hear and this is what we're commonly taught, is that the cervical curve is kyphotic in the womb. Not true at all. In fact, the cervical curve forms because the extensor muscles start to fire as the baby's moving around. It starts to put load on the ossification centers in the vertebral bodies, in the lamina, in the pedicle, in the spinous process, and in the facet or the articular pillars of the vertebra. That load stimulates growth of the vertebral body. This is what it's for. It also, the curve corresponds to the, the development of the cardiac and respiratory nuclei in the brainstem of interest. That might have some significance. So what we've learned is if your baby is born with a kyphotic neck or a reversed neck curve, that is not normal. That is not the normal state for the cervical lordosis. So it says here, 
Babies should be born with a neck curve. If they don't have one, something happened, some kind of developmental abnormality in the womb, some type of birth trauma like forceps pulling on the kid's head and neck. Is that a good thing? I'll leave that to you. I'm gonna say, you know, that force distraction pulling on the baby's head and neck, that's not how nature intended. When the baby goes through the birth canal, it's head first, it's compression loading on the cervical spine, not tension loading. Maybe that changes the neck curve. The other thing is, what about the vacuum distra distraction, C-sections? You know what, when you pull distraction on the neck, could that take the neck curve out? I'll leave the answer to that question for you to determine. But the reality of it is, babies should be born with a neck curve. So here's a fetal ultrasound at 20, approximately 20 weeks from a colleague of mine. When I was teaching a conference on this, I showed this paper and it shocks doctors. Many doctors are like, well, no way, I don't believe that. And I go, hey, it's not a belief, it's an actual fact. Go to the Journal of Anatomy 1977 or pick up any fetal ultrasound textbook when it talks about development of the, the uh, the fetus during different stages and you can identify whether or not the fetus has a cervical curvature. Here's my friend's uh, little boy inside the womb at 20 weeks. Notice what you see in the cervical column. You see a well-defined cervical lordotic curvature. This is the thoracic or rib cage curve. That's the classic kyphosis, but look at the lordosis in the neck. That's the way it's supposed to develop. Now, here's my kid. Here's my kid right here, and just for fun, I put this in there. This is my kid's neck when he was a, a young child. You know, this is when he was a baby. And here he is, and I'm not trying to be rude, but what we said for the picture, we said, say hi to the camera, Aiden, and he's giving it the bird. We didn't do that on purpose, I promise you. It's kind of a fun little story. I used to send this photo to my dad, and I would say, hey, Grandpa Don, Aiden says hi, and my dad would write back to me. He'd say, ah, Harrison, communication starts early, right? Sign language. So anyway, just for fun, but there's my oldest boy, Aiden. He's now 13, but he's got a beautiful cervical curve in his neck. That's the way it's supposed to work, right? There's me holding him back in my younger days when I actually had some hair, great. The thing is, we know this. We know that the pediatric spine, its curve in the neck, is going to be different than the adult. We do know it develops after birth, but it is formed inside the womb. It just accentuates after birth. Well, here's what we know. There's very little data on this in kids, by the way. In 1996, a paper was published on 22-year-olds, 23-year-olds, 24-year-olds. So basically 20 kids in each group. We have x-rays as early as two years old. And here's what we find. The C2 to C7 angle, the way we report it in CBP, is 32 degrees at two years old. Well, what does it average in adults? Well, it averages, depending on the study you read, anywhere from 23 to 34 degrees. So you can see in this particular project in 1996, the kids were actually in the lower 30s. Now, there is a caveat or a condition of this particular project in 1996. We had to convert this data in 1996 to the method that's reported here because here's what they actually reported. This study reported Cobb angles, C3 to C7, in these two, three, four, all the way up to 18 year old kids. We had to estimate what then the uh, addition of the C2 vertebra would be and then what it would be if we measured it with the method that we do on the back of the vertebral bodies. So in this particular systematic literature review by Paul Oakley and myself, this table two is actually in there where we take the data from Kasai in 1996 and we convert it into usable data that we're familiar with in adults. So the idea is this is what we find in the kids. This is the difference between the ideal adult value and the kids at that age. And then this would be the average adult data, right? So the average adult data versus the uh, ideal adult data, right? So excuse me, this one's the average adult data and this one's the, the difference between ideal and the pediatric data. Okay, so we know that the kids should have a cervical lordosis somewhere inside the womb. At what age, we don't exactly know, but eight to 23 weeks conceptual age. We know that we should be born with one. We know at the age of two years old, we have a really nice deep cervical lordosis. We know that as the kid ages, 
up to about nine years old, we start to see a flattening of the cervical curve where the kid loses about a third of the cervical curve between the age of nine to 12 years of age. So the pediatric development of the cervical curve is kind of interesting. It does drop in its magnitude of curvature between the age of nine and 12. That's due to the way the rest of the spine is forming. But then after the age of 12, if you look in this table right here, after the age of 12, we start to see that the magnitude of the cervical curve starts to increase again up to the adult value, okay? So this becomes usable data for us to look at pediatric populations. If you're two years old, we expect you know, a curve that could be as deep as 32 degrees. If you're nine years old, we expect you to have a curve that's roughly 20 degrees, right? But the point is you should have a cervical curve. Now, if you don't have one, are there problems? Well, let's look at this. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot this slide was in there. Bummer, I should have just looked at, at the screen. Uh, th this is an x-ray of a child to remind me to tell you that there are also cases that have too much curvature. So here's an eight-year-old child. We take this normative data that we just looked at, and an eight-year-old, according to that table, should have a 22 to 23 degree curve. Well, what does this kid have? This kid has 41 degrees. So this dashed green line shows the idealized value. This shows the pediatric curve in this particular kid. There's way too much curvature. Now you don't wanna see that either. This spine has some injury. There's a retrolisthesis or a backward shift of C2 on C3. You can see it back here. This part of the bone of C2 should line up with that part of the bone on C3. That's called the spinal laminar line. So we have a backward shift or what we call a retro posterior translation of C2 on C3 and we have too much curvature in this kid's neck that's a problem too. However, this particular project we're looking at in 2015 from CBP, the systematic review, we only looked at methods to increase the cervical curve in kids, not kids like this to decrease it. Okay, so then quickly what we'll do is, are there studies that show that loss of the curve is a, is a problem in pediatric populations? The answer preliminarily is yes, there is preliminary evidence. Is there 100% conclusive evidence? Maybe not, but there is some interesting things that I believe anatomically provide conclusive evidence. So some interesting articles. Number one, this one I like because it is an anatomical fact. Okay, it is not a clinical trial where we might have, you know, not enough subjects in it or maybe improper methods, whatever it is. This is an anatomical fact. Check this out from 1994. The most important anatomical parameter in the lateral cervical view to facilitate the switch from nasal to oral ventilation in human infants is a cervical extension creating a physiological lordosis of the neck that results in opening of the veloglossal and veloepiglottic sphincters. In other words, the ability to breathe through your nose and through your mouth. Here's a cross section. This right here is the veloepiglottic sphincter. So if you look right here, that's the vel veloepiglottic sphincter. When the neck is bent in slight flexion or a reversal of the mid and upper neck curve, that shuts down that airway, shuts it off. The veloepiglottic sphincter is closed. You can't breathe through it. When you put your head in extension, opening up the airway, it creates a cervical lordosis. Look what happens. Now we get airflow through this area. This is how we ventilate, this is how we respirate. This is why in CPR, you're trained to put the head back in its neutral position and slightly extend the upper neck. Why? Because it opens the airway. Now picture this. If your neck is bent down and you're a little baby, it's closing down the passage for the airway. It's a physical anatomical construction or obstruction. It's a constraint. You can't get airflow in there. So you see parents putting you know, pillows behind babies' necks when they're sleeping. Worst thing in the world to do. Worst thing in the world. Little babies' heads are huge compared to the rest of their body. Do not put a pillow behind the back of their head. 
You know, you've heard of sudden infant death syndrome. This may be one of the mechanisms anatomically that contributes to that. I'm not saying it's 100% cause and effect, I'm saying it's contributing to it. If you lose that upper cervical curve, it closes down the airway. Now the kid cannot respirate, cannot get air through. So consider this, anatomically we are designed to have a cervical curve. To me, I look at that and I go, well that's clear proof evidence for me. I don't care about clinical studies now because anatomically it's a fact. Back to this. Hopefully you like my colorful uh, commentary. I like it, by the way. JMPT 2005 by my good friend, uh, uh, Dr. Jeb McAvaney and colleagues out of Australia and then myself. Uh, this was a, a project primarily looking at adults and the correlation between loss of the cervical curve and neck pain. However, we did have kids in it. We had kids as young as nine years of age in this and what was identified in kids up or uh, just from nine and up, so nine to 18, we found that if they had curves under 20 degrees from C2 to C7 using this measurement here, under 20 degrees, it was statistically correlated to neck pain. Now, the 20 degree mark is very important. That correlates nicely with the 1996 paper that I just went through from Kasai et al. So you put this data together and you go, wow, this is really informative material in the sense that now I've got a cut point. 20 degrees and under for your cervical curve seems to be a problem with neck pain. Okay, so this is the measurement. And then I'll just show you, this is the distribution of uh, curvatures in non-neck pain subjects versus neck pain subjects. So cervical means neck pain, other means non-neck pain. That means our asymptomatic control. This less than 20 means we're talking about pediatric populations in years. I'm under 20 years of age. Look here, look at the cervical curve. It's above 20 degrees in the asymptomatic subjects. Look at the kids that are below uh, 20 years of age that have pain. Their curves are around zero degrees in their mean and median. And then you can see the standard deviations here. Now, if you look at this, this is strongly statistically different in this age group, okay? So it didn't matter what the age was in our population, whether it was you know, 20 to 29 year olds, 30 to 39 year olds, it was clear that subjects with pain had curves that were under 20 degrees, including pediatric uh, cases. This is very important. I'll skip this particular slide. Okay, so now, We've got clear evidence from the literature that indicates that loss of the cervical curve anatomically creates a problem with ventilation. Closes down the veloepiglottic and the veloglossal sphincters. Okay, also we see from the literature that kids under uh, 20 years of age, if they have neck pain, they tend to have curves under 20 degrees. So in our opinion, this warrants studies looking at rehabilitation of the cervical curve in these uh, pediatric populations. So then what's the evidence? Well, what we did is we did a, a comprehensive literature search. It had to be a peer-reviewed study. If it was in a textbook, it didn't count. Even if that textbook was a published textbook, it's not the same as a peer-reviewed study. So only peer-reviewed studies count like trade journals don't count, okay? For example, I edit a trade journal called the Mer American Journal of Clinical Chiropractic. It's not a peer-reviewed journal. Even though I'm an editor of it, I'm the publisher of it, I'm the owner of it, it's not peer-reviewed. Things like Today's Chiropractic or the American Chiropractor, they don't count. It has to be an indexed, peer-reviewed publication, okay? The bad news is, we only identified 11 publications that fit our criteria. So it had to be a hypolordotic cervical curve, had to be a kid under the age of 18, and it had to be in the peer-reviewed literature. Only 11 cases were identified, or excuse me, 11 studies were identified. Okay, we'll find out that one of them is a randomized trial, but it's a very, very small sample size and it wouldn't make what you would call proper systematic literature reviews for inclusion of RCTs. It just had a very small sample size. So we have 11 publications. Seven of these 11 reported x-ray measurements where we could identify that the cervical curve did indeed increase from the treatment. In four out of the 11, the papers only commented on the improvement of the cervical curve. So what that means is we don't even know did it really truly effectively increase the curve? Because if you eyeball something, 
your understanding is not appropriate. You have to quantify it in order to prove it. So four out of the 11 studies, roughly 40% didn't even report measurements. So the, the problem is this, only five studies actually out of these 11 used measurement method that is actually reported in the literature to be a reliable, repeatable measurement method where examiners can get the same measurement from session A to session B. So that's five out of the 11 are actually what you would call quality publications in terms of did it actually report a true method of measurement to assess or quantify the loss of the curve and the increase in curve. Of interest, all those studies were CBP studies of interest. Okay, so here's the, the breakdown. Of these 11 papers, five of them were CBP publications, chiropractic biophysics. Two of them were Gonstead publications. Two of them were toggle recoil, which is a type of upper cervical adjusting technique. Uh, one of them was the Atlas Orthogonal Group. Uh, that one was actually the randomized trial. Very small sample size though. And then one of them was the Pettibon system. Okay, now, if you look at these, you would go, well, Deed, they, they use methods that are reliable. Well, in theory, they do, but in the publication, if it's not reported, then you can't claim that they did it. Okay, so this is the challenge. Yes, in the Pettibon technique, they use the same measurement method for cervical curvature that we do in CBP, C2 to C7 posterior body lines, but if they don't report it in the study, you can't confirm or refute whether or not they did it, so the fact of the matter is you conclude that they didn't do it. Okay, so here's the breakdown. When we look at the table of it, in terms of the age of the kids, uh, the 2004 study by uh, uh, Tony Bistecki, uh, uh, pediatric case, age five, the kid had ADHD. Uh, Fedorchuk, Curtis Fedorchuk, 2009, kid was 13, had headaches. Uh, Fedorchuk, 2014, kid was 11, had asthma. Uh, Oakley, 2011, kid was eight, had headaches. Now these are the CBP studies. I know these studies really, really well, by the way. Uh, some of them I was involved with, some of them I was not, but all of them uh, I knew of their existence and I, I screened the projects, in fact, and I've read all of these papers. So I can tell you the outcomes, when we did cervical curve corrective care, the outcomes showed resolution of these cases. Okay, or resolution of these conditions, which is you can't really in a case make cause and effect, but the reality of it is these were chronic cases. Nothing else was working. When we corrected the neck curve, these kids got better. So I look at this with parents and I go, well, wouldn't you like to try a non-surgical or a non-drug option? Wouldn't you just even want to give it a chance? If it doesn't work, so be it. But what if it did work? What if correcting your kid's neck curve took away the asthma and your kid didn't have asthma anymore. Would that be a good thing? I go, geez, you know, parents, let's wake up to the reality of this. Find a good CBP trained chiropractor. You know, what do you have to lose? If it doesn't work, you can still take the drugs. You know, go ahead, right? Craziness out there. The Gonstead uh, publication by Alcantara, Joe Alcantara does some great work. Uh, he's a colleague that I, I'm very familiar with. Age two, look at that kid had myasthenia gravis. Wow. He showed great improvement in this uh, pediatric case by doing Gonstead adjusting. Uh, and it also improved the cervical curve, at least reported. Uh, Gonstead Aragi et al., 1995. Uh, this was actually one of my guest instructors at Life University. I don't know if he remembers me, but I remember him. Uh, great publication, two-year-old kid with head injury. Uh, reported uh, improving, uh, pr improvement of the cervical curve and improvement of the sequela of the head injury in the child. Uh, the toggle recoil paper by Dobson, a five-year-old kid, corrected posture and improved the asthma in this case. We don't know how much improvement in the curve because it wasn't accurately reported. And then Atlas Orthogonal, the Corshid paper, uh, these were kids with autism. They were aged four to 16 years of age, very small sample size. Uh, you would, pr even though it's reported as a randomized trial, it's more like a prospective case series, in my opinion, not to discredit that, but the reality of it is that that's the magnitude of it. It's not a large enough sample size uh, for statistical significance. And then uh, they reported improvement in the cervical curve. How much, we don't know, not a proper measurement that's uh, reliable. However, they reported in the study 
a pretty dramatic improvement in some of these kids with autism, which is an amazing thing, right? You got your parent out there and you've got an autistic child, why not try a conservative approach like upper cervical chiropractic adjusting in hopes that it would improve the autism? Even if it only improves it a little bit, that's a huge deal for this child and the family that's caregiving for this child with autism. What an amazing thing, right? More work needs to be done, obviously, but geez, this offers some really nice hope for these kids and the parents and the family, right? Uh, then the Pedabon study in 2009, four-year-old child with ADHD uh, reported improvement in the cervical curvature and improvement in the ADHD. Okay, the reality of it is, where's the best evidence? All of them are really much, they were pretty much, they break down into cases. So what we have to do is we have to look at which system reported the greatest amount of change, which system used a method that's reliable and repeatable, and then which system actually has true randomized trials on the methods in adult populations. Well, if we use that criteria, then we're left with CBP is really still the gold standard. So since I'm the president of CBP, I'm biased, you could say, but the reality of it is, prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. That's where the data is. The most credible data to date on restoring the cervical curve, whether it's pediatric cases or adult cases, lies in mirror image methods. Mirror image is CBP, and I'll show you what that means. It's not that these other techniques aren't effective, it's that you should take those other techniques and add CBP mirror image care to them. If you want to improve the cervical curve, it makes sense to adjust it into a corrective form. Increase the curve by the position and then apply a controlled thrust with your hand or with an instrument to improve the cervical curve. It's called mirror image. My dad trademarked that term back in the 1980s. So it's a registered trademark of CBP, mirror image adjusting. Makes logical sense, right? So you can add this to any technique you're out there. If you're a chiropractor, don't get mad at me and say, hey, well, Dr. Deed said CBP is the only way to do it. Not exactly. I said it was the gold standard. I said it was the best. I didn't say it was the only way. What I'm telling you right now Add this to what you're, you are doing. If you're a patient out there, find a chiropractor that uses this because it is the most effective way to improve the cervical curve. Mirror image adjusting, shown here. Then you add mirror image exercise to it. You put a strap and you load the cervical curve forward and then you bend backwards over it. We do that in a repeated manner over and over again at least three to five times a week. Now obviously young kids can't do this at the age of two, three, and four. However, I have had five-year-olds and up do this effectively. We can teach them to do 10 repetitions and call it good. They think it's quite fun, right? So you give them the lighter band, the red strap there. I'm showing it here with my older sister, Holly, because she's quite weak. You can see she has no triceps there. Just kidding, Holly. Uh, but that is the... Uh, the less resistance band, it's the red one. Five-year-olds can do this too, right? So Holly's as strong as a five-year-old, pretty cool. The idea is load the apex of the cervical curve down low. If it's in the middle, load it in the middle. This is called the prolordotic exerciser. Your CBP trained chiropractor can provide this to you and recommend where you use it, how you use it. You can't just arbitrarily use it. You need to find out where in the neck it needs to go. And then the, the final piece, is what we call mirror image traction. So we've got adjusting, we've got exercising, and we've got traction. We actually refer to it in the other way around. We flip adjusting and exercise, so we go exercise, adjust, and traction. That way it's E-A-T, we say eat for simplicity. Exercise, adjust, and traction. So traction is sustained forces to load the cervical curve back into its proper position. Depending on the exact case, we'll use a different method. So shown here are a couple cases. This one is really easy to use in kids, a little bungee strap, hanging their head over it, or better yet, nowadays we use what's called the pediatric cervical denaroll. So this denaroll is sized for roughly kids that uh, age between five and 10 years of age, but it really depends on their body size, right? So we take an x-ray of the kid's neck, we identify where the, the uh, loss of the curve is, and then we'll place the peak of the denaroll at that location. 
It must be done under prescription. You do not get to just buy this and apply it because you do not know if your kid actually needs this. It must be based on prescription because the first rule of any healthcare system, including what we do in chiropractic biophysics, is do no harm. And if we don't know what we're trying to do, with this dental roll, we don't have a clear idea of what the neck actually looks like in the kid's condition, you should not proceed and apply this. So it's a prescription-based product. I need the public out there to understand that. Uh, so the reality of it is when we do these mirror image methods, exercise adjusting and traction, we get amazing changes in the neck. This one comes from the, night, or the uh, 2004 project by Bastecchi et al. in JMPT. So this is one of the case studies. I'm just showing you the before and after reported with a reliable method and you can visually see the difference. In some cases, you don't need uh, you know, to put a number on it to see it. Hey, this is a reverse neck. Hey, this is much better. If you're blind, you can't see it, right? But if you can see visually, you can see it, right? It's there. Right? So if you do not have the ability to have sight, then you would say, well, I can't see it. Well, anybody else that has vision can agree that that curve is better. And I'm being a little facetious here just to make a point, but you should put numbers on it. The reality in this particular project, it was a fun project to do, but it was also a little bit disappointing because we believed we would find more evidence. Uh, so what we identified is this. In pediatric patients, uh, CBP extension traction procedures uh, for increasing the cervical lordosis appear to be the most promising. Uh, they led to the largest changes. They led to, uh, or the studies had reliable methods in there so we could be clear in terms of the numbers that we were using. So they, they appear to be the most promising. However, the study by Atlas Orthogonal, it is a randomized trial even though it's a very small sample size that also needs to be mentioned in the sense that, hey, that shows consistent change in the cervical curve, but the problem is they didn't accurately report it with a reliable measurement. And then there is some promise for that upper cervical technique as well. That's what we uh, put in there. Limitations, we only found 11 projects in the entire uh, uh, peer-reviewed database that we could locate. Uh, future studies need to address the, the problems in these projects. They need to use larger sample sizes. That they need to use reliable measure, measurement methods and they should also report the data a little bit better like what is the number of treatments that were used in each case how many visits were actually done what's the time frame and let's do some uh, a little bit better outcomes in these studies so proper questionnaires etc and it's not that the studies didn't have some of that it's just some of the studies were missing some key information um, so it says here, provide better detailed documentation of all procedures performed on these pediatric patients. And then really now it's time uh, to up the game and start to do some really nice projects like case series, larger sample sizes, and non-randomized trials and randomized trials in pediatric populations. And then best yet, the number one type of study that we really want to see is a multi-center trial where uh, like in, for example, in my group, 10 CBP trained offices get together and we uh, prospectively put 10 pediatric cases in each. So now we've got 100 cases, 10 from each office, and we prospectively watch and see what happens. Now, obviously this needs IRB approval and we would do that, but these are the types of studies that need to be done now on pediatric populations. It is a little disheartening that such a major area of the spine and perhaps a major impact in terms of the health of the child, the cervical curvature only has 11 studies in the literature on it. So that's a little bit disappointing, but the good news is there's hope and promise from these 11 studies. Hopefully you enjoyed this uh, particular project. Uh, until next time, I'm Dr. Deed Harrison. Thank you for your time and attention.